ragazzi, benvenuti a Bien, oggi siamo con Omega per scoprire la collezione Chronoscope. Venite con me che andiamo a parlare con il loro Head of Brand Heritage. Ciao ragazzi, bentornati su VS, oggi sono in compagnia del signor Petros Protopapas, direttore del Brand Heritage di Omega. Oggi siamo qui per scoprire un pochino meglio la storia di Chronoscope, e della nuova collezione che è stata lanciata l'anno scorso. So, thank you Petros for being here with us today. It's such a pleasure to be uh, here with such an enthusiast and expert of Omega. So Fabrizio, thank you for coming actually and taking the time. It's good to have you here. Um, so, uh, indeed, uh, there is a lot, lot of things to discuss uh, because chronoscope, um, as you mentioned, um, we want to focus on the chronoscope, but in order to discuss the, the meaning behind it and why we did it, We have to like delve in the past a little bit to understand the chronographs yeah. uh, because it's also about the naming conventions. And uh, so I'm very happy to discuss this with you, yes. Great, because when, when the first chrono, uh, chronoscope came out, I mean, uh, the, the first new models, I was very interested. I was like wondering what chronoscope meant. So what, can you tell me a bit more about it? So yes, yeah, about chronometry, about timekeeping, about Omega sure. history, about it. I can, I can tell you practically, well, not all, but a lot of things about it. And as a Greek especially, I can do this because it's a Greek name actually. Not only the company we all work for here, um, Omega, um, but also Chronoscope. Also Chronograph is a Greek word. So yes, it's an honor to explain this to you. Um, and it has to do with a naming convention and a small historical error. Not on our side, but let's just say from on anybody's side, because Chronograph as a word that we know today exists basically because everybody kept this historical error and never corrected it. So in the Greek language, chronograph means literally to write time. Chronos, time, and graph, graph, uh, graphene is to write. And interestingly enough, the time writer basically, people think that this was the world's first chronograph uh, because in fact, yes, there was a watch if you want, that upon the push of a button would be able with ink on the white porcelain or enamel dial to literally leave points of starting time and, uh, and, and ending time. So you could actually read the written time if you want, the written time symbols of the white dial. Hence it was called the time writer. But if you think, uh, you know, we all know and love chronographs, a chronograph today doesn't write time. It actually shows you the time, the elapsed time. So in 1885, the company that we are now, which means Omega, before we were named Omega, which as you hopefully know happened in 1894, before the company was named Omega, the, we had a lot of sister brands, like another, like a lot of like side companies that were working under the same roof, like a small virtual group of yeah. companies basically. And one of them, that was called Gurzelen. And Gurzelen is actually the part of the city of Bien that we are here today. So the brand was called Gurzelen by the name of the part of the city. And that brand, which was basically us, uh, developed the chronograph in the form of a pocket watch. In 1885, I don't know if you wow. please handle it. Yeah. Um, and interestingly enough, This is one of the world's first iterations of a true chronograph, as we know it today, because you have a watch that shows the time of the day, but you have a dedicated push button to start, stop, and reset it, with an hour counter even, and it works like today's chronographs, but we had the wisdom to name it correctly. So in fact, we named it Time Shower, because that's what it does. It's a chronograph shows you the elapsed time. So we named it chronoscope because we said, wait a minute, it doesn't write anything, it shows you something. Hence, the first correct naming convention for a chronograph was chronoscope, and it was by this very company in, in 1885. That's amazing, it's such ahead of time, like yeah. uh, for, for the brand, for watchmaking, I guess. So. I mean, to have, a, to have a, a, a chronograph, as we would say today, but actually it's a time, time show, like a chronoscope that can measure 
up to 11 hours and 59 minutes and 59 seconds like a Speedmaster or a Seamaster chronograph or any, any let's say, usual chronograph of today, we, we think this is normal. But if you go back in time so long ago, 1885, and you have a chronograph yeah. uh, that is called correctly, chronoscope, and it measures up to the same standards of today. This is uh, science fiction for the yeah. time. Absolutely, I agree. And I see some scales. Uh, there are few watches here on the table, and I see some scales. <laughs> so what about, what can you tell me about these other watches that I okay. see here? Um, so we've put together from the Heritage Department, from the museum actually, a few nice chronographs for you, although they're all actually time showers. Um, so first of all, we have a model from the 1930s. So this yes. model is beautiful. It's powered by the Omega Caliber 28.9 Cro for chronograph. And uh, 28.9 is actually the diameter of the movement in millimeters. So it's quite a small chronograph caliber actually for its time. It was one of the smallest in the world at the time. And um, two distinctions for this model that I think for you and for your viewers is, might be interesting. Uh, first of all, you have the multitude of scales on the dial, as you correctly mentioned. So you have the usual, from today's standpoint, you have the usual uh, tachymeter scale, yeah. but you have the additional telemeter scale, for example, and you have also the additional pulsometer scale. What the tachymeter does, I think everybody knows yeah. or yeah. should know. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, a telemeter was hugely important, unfortunately, at that time, because we talk about the start of the Second World War. With a telemeter on your chronograph, you could actually measure safely the distance between yourself and, let's say, your enemy, the artillery fire. So if, if, if you're like in front of you in like 10 kilometers or whatever, you have, uh, you have the enemy um, firing at you yeah. with cannonballs, um, then at that time there's no radar, there is no radio communication, so you don't yeah, know how far away, exactly. So the only way you had during the war, yeah, so if you are in the trenches and you're lucky enough to have a chronograph with you, so you're actually an officer, how you can measure the distance is like this. When in the horizon you see the light flash of a gun being fired, then you start your chronograph, and when you hear the sound of that gun in your ears, uh, you stop the chronograph. And because of the difference between the speed of light and the speed of sound, the light is faster. That's why you see it first. But the sound travels slower. So by reading of the tip of the second's hand where it stopped, when you hear the sound of the gun, you can read directly the distance in kilometers or in miles, depending on how the calibration is. So this is why chronographs were so important in, in, the, in the war. And this model is also quite important, not only, um, not only um, because of the multitude of scales and the fact that it is also a, a time shower because of the scales, it is important for two reasons, actually for one big reason, um, aviation. Yeah. A lot of people think about pilots' watches and what do they mean today. And everybody has his or her own interpretation. A pilot needs something that is very easy to read. Otherwise, you get lost with all kinds of things and turning bezels and what you have. I don't think there is a single pilot out, of, out there, and I was a pilot, that would really use um, yeah, a bezel to, to calculate uh, fuel flow while you fly. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, at least I never did it. Um, but you need clear, easy indications. So two very important people chose this watch as their personal watches. Uh, one was Amelia Earhart, the famous aviatrix, like lady pilot from the United States. Um, so she and her navigator chose as her own personal watches, chronographs, um, this exact model, but in stainless steel. We have it here in gold. And uh, to come back to Italy, none other than Italo Balbo. Um, he chose also the watch not only for him, for his wrist, but also for his team pilots, because Italo Balbo organized a, quite a legendary, let's call it air race, uh, between Roma and Chicago. Yes, amazing. So imagine an array of seaplanes, and you know like Italy was famous uh, in, the, in the old days uh, for seaplanes. 
uh, you, have a, you have a very important plane uh, manufacturers in Italy that were specializing in, in, in water planes or seaplanes. So they took off with several seaplanes and they traveled through the Mediterranean all the way through the Atlantic Ocean, all the way to Chicago um, to actually land at the world's, you know, the world's fair at the time. Uh, and this was like a legendary uh, feat of aviation and all the pilots of Italo Balbo only himself wore the same model uh, on their wrist, also in stainless steel. So that's why we chose it, especially for, for, for you coming here. Yeah, that's amazing. I think it also this, this event was ahead of time, like okay. traveling from uh, all the way from Italy to Chicago. It was, yeah. wow. People think of all kinds of Atlantic crossings, but they never go other than the Atlantic. Here you, you cross also the Mediterranean. It's a huge distance yeah. and it's a navigational feat. And you do this with not one plane, but with several as a group. And they had to organize themselves in flight so that they appear over the sky in the United States as a, as a group formation. Imagine, imagine the skills yeah, no, these pilots no instrument. have. And no instrument other than the watches yeah. and a few basic instrumentation in the, in the cockpits. Yeah, that's amazing. And also, we have another one. It's a black dial. <laughs> we, you had many other watch, some other watches, but I chose the black dial one. Nice. What can you tell me about this so, one? So, same... Um, same idea basically behind. So you have like, a, again, I would say a multitude of uh, different scales on the dial that serve different purposes, like on the other watches, like on the Amelia Earhart or Italo Balbo model. Um, this time on a black dial, uh, because the, the contrast in colors makes it, makes it also easier to read. Um, I can tell you also the two movements are, let's say, related. Yeah, you can have a better look. Um, they actually share the same family provenance. As I told you, the, lit the smaller version is the 28.9 Cro for chronograph. This one is the quite legendary and quite known also in the auction world. Collectors love this one. It's the 33.3 Cro. Uh, it's slightly a bit bigger um, in diameter and uh, quite valuable actually also in the vintage, um, vintage market today. And uh, it's a personal choice, this one, because I personally love this case shape. I love the round, um, the round case shape with the, with the straight lugs. For me, this is like a brilliant 1930s, 1940s case design that, uh, that um, yeah, one day I hope uh, somebody will come up with <laughs> it. Uh, I don't know who's listening. <laughs> somebody sure. should come up with this uh -huh. even today. Absolutely. So, um, the, again, the button also are very cool. Uh, the, the shape. The shape, is, the oval, the oval yeah, pushers, exactly. exactly. And, um, so we chose it actually again, like the other model, because it has this multitude of scales on the dial, because this is exactly what we did on the Speedmaster chronoscope. So we wanted to show, with you, to show to you that in fact, we didn't just design a watch because we think it's cool. There is always a historical precedence that we get inspired from at Omega. And um, when we talk about the chronoscope as a Speedmaster, then there is, some people might think there's a little bit of a, let's say, an antagonism there, mm -hmm. because the Speedmaster on, on the one hand is meant to be like the cleanest chronograph possible, you know, simple black dial, white indexes, you know, like very yeah. to your face, easy to read. This is one of the requirements also that astronauts had to just immediately do this and then you know what's going on. So then why put more on the dial, although we like to say how the Speedmaster was born. But then again, if you think about the heritage of Omega, like we always had these dials, we always, we had the name, we had always this idea to put information in a legible yeah, way on the dials, it. and then we have one legendary watch. So if you think about, uh, although I'm wearing a Seamaster today, but if you think about which is the watch that probably everybody will associate with Omega, it's a Speedmaster, at least I think. So. It would be a pity, actually, to leave the Speedmaster out of the Omega heritage. So we thought when we wanted to get back to our roots, to, 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 to go back to what we've done in the past, um, the obvious choice, although we've come to love the black and white look of the Speedmaster, it's the obvious choice. It's like you have this legendary chronograph, so why wouldn't you adapt it to its own history? So to me, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer 
that the yeah. Speedmaster was, uh, was chosen because it's sort of, it's a continuation of, of Omega's legacy, basically, also in a non-black and white version. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's, uh, it, it's the perfect choice, I would say. And then we have a modern piece here. I would say modern because it, the, you see the style, you see the, the case sides, it's more modern. And it has the chronoscope <laughs> name on it. So exactly. what can you tell me about so this? So here we are in the 2000s. Um, so this is again, this is obviously a chronograph, but again, correctly, correctly named. Um, it's basically a regular chronograph. I mean, regular, it was Omega's first coaxial uh, chronograph caliber at the time, automatic, um, the 3313. And uh, we used a slightly different design of the dial you can, if yeah. you want to see, I mean, you can still relate to the classic um, layout of a chronograph, you know, like uh, three o'clock, six o'clock, nine o'clock, but we changed the way it looks to make time reading more important. And this is what I've tried to convey to you before, like at Omega, it's, it's, it's always nice, it's always good that we are able to go back to history, to our history, because we have shaped we have shaped uh, watchmaking history, uh, not only in the past, but we'll continue to shape it. But the whole point is, it's real history. It's like, it's true watchmaking history. So it's, you just open the door to, to the company's archives at Heritage or the museum, and you find all these things. So suddenly, like in the year, two, like in the 2000s, like 2006, um, imagine a product manager asking Heritage, like, okay, Okay, we need to do something. We need to. We want to do a nice new dial and whatever. We go in the archives and we come up with this, the first yeah. chronoscope, and it's it's a logical, it's a logical continuation. So in the in like in the in the mid two thousands we we did this. We named it again after the original chronoscope, trying to explain again this is how a chronograph should be named today, and. Um, I remember when I was not working yet at Omega, this was one of the watches that I always wanted to buy. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I never got to. Uh, uh, but now, I mean, now they're there and, and, yeah. and I actually love it. And it's, it's a beautiful way how the dial is, is made, even the date. It's meant to, you can see the date before, the day after. Yeah. It's all designed to, 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 to show you the flow of time. It's all meant to take the word chronoscope, like time shower, literally. Yeah. And this is what I love so much about, about the design and the original name. Yeah, you're right. The, the date also and the, the counter as well, it, it really shows the chronoscope. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's like it speaks to you. It's so like, look at me, read off me. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Pedros. It's been an amazing conversation. I, I really understood what chronoscope means and what uh, the history behind it uh, is, so thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Uh, glad that I was able to help and um, I hope you will enjoy the museum uh, whenever you visit it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bene ragazzi, spero che questa conversazione con Petros sia stata interessante e vi abbia fatto capire un pochino il contesto da dove nasce la collezione Chronoscope. Adesso entriamo un pochino più nel dettaglio di questi nuovi orologi. Gli orologi sono stati declinati in sette versioni differenti. Ne abbiamo sei in acciaio e una in bronze gold. Abbiamo quattro quadranti differenti. Partiamo da un blu con contatore argento, poi una versione invece con quadrante argento con contatori nello stesso tono e poi una versione un pochino più racing, quindi con i contatori neri e dei dettagli rosso. L'ultima versione invece è la versione bronze gold che come vi dicevamo è in questa lega realizzata da Omega e ha un quadrante marrone color cioccolato con i contatori argento. Il quadrante del chronoscope ha molte informazioni, infatti abbiamo tre scale diverse, abbiamo il tachimetro, la scala pulsometrica e il telemetro. Può sembrare complicato da leggere ma in realtà è molto semplice. Per cercare di capire bene come utilizzare queste scale partiamo dal tachimetro. Il tachimetro è una scala che tutti i cronografi hanno e serve per misurare le velocità medie. Quindi immaginiamo magari un, una macchina che parte dal punto X e arriva al punto Y, attivando il cronografo è possibile misurare la velocità media in questo tragitto. Poi abbiamo la scala pulsometrica che serviva ai medici all'epoca per misurare i battiti cardiaci e poi abbiamo il telemetro. 
La scala telemetrica permette di misurare la distanza tra un fenomeno visibile e uno udibile. Quindi immaginiamo di avere di fronte a noi un temporale. Noi attiveremo il cronografo alla vista di un fulmine e lo stopperemo all'udito del tuono. L'informazione che vedremo sul quadrante sarà la distanza in chilometri tra noi e il fulmine. Potrei dilungarmi molto a parlare di queste scale tachimetriche, ma secondo me con queste informazioni saprete usare benissimo il vostro cronoscope. Parlando invece del movimento abbiamo un calibro, il calibro 9908, che è un derivato del 9900. Possiamo vedere un motivo Code de Genève a spirale che occupa praticamente tutto il movimento. Questo calibro ha permesso a Omega di rendere l'orologio leggermente più sottile rispetto al classico Moonwatch. Quindi abbiamo 12,8 mm per il chronoscope, mentre abbiamo 13,2 per il classico Moonwatch. Il nuovo chronoscope è stato particolarmente apprezzato anche per un dettaglio in particolare, che è la microregolazione sul cinturino. Questa microregolazione permette di allargare di pochi millimetri il bracciale, rendendolo quindi molto adattabile a ogni tipo di polso. A volte con, togliendo una maglia non si riesce ad ottenere la misura perfetta per il proprio polso, ma questo chronoscope lo permette. Personalmente io sono un grande fan del nuovo cronoscope e non saprei spiegarvi il motivo a parole. Devo dire che quando ho visto per la prima volta questi quadranti sono rimasto particolarmente colpito, anche perché un, uno Speedmaster così non l'avevo mai visto. Ovviamente questi modelli si posizionano leggermente più alti a livello di prezzo rispetto al classico Moonwatch, con 8900 euro sulla versione col bracciale, mentre 9200 per la versione in acciaio con bracciale. Beh ragazzi, spero di avervi fatto scoprire il Chronoscope sotto una nuova prospettiva. Ringrazio Petros per questa bella chiacchierata e ringrazio il team Omega per l'ospitalità. Ci vediamo al prossimo video.